This is an important announcement, especially if you live in Los Angeles. I am shooting my special Wednesday, December 14th at the Dynasty Typewriter Theater here in Los Angeles. Uh, Tickets are available on my website right now at ryansickler.com. And here's the deal. If you use code Sickler, and I'm telling you specifically you all because you all are the diehards, if you use code Sickler, you're getting half off your tickets, all right? So uh, we're going to do two shows, Wednesday, December 14th. Go snag those tickets up now. I want a loaded house. Let's have a great time bringing an end to this Night Pants Nation tour for the special that you guys will see uh, very soon, hopefully. Chicago, I'll be there November 11th and 12th. Grand Rapids, Michigan, December 9th and 10th. Get your tickets to those shows and all shows on my website at ryansickler.com. The Honeydew with Ryan Sickler. Welcome back to the Honeydew, y'all. We're over here doing it in the Night Pan Studios. I'm Ryan Sickler, ryansickler.com, Ryan Sickler on all your social medias. Um, listen, all seriousness here, this is episode 200, and I want to just really say thank you so much. I know this show makes a difference, okay? I, I get flooded with emails and messages and just being out on the road and you guys coming up to me and telling me that, this show has saved your life, or it's the reason you started therapy, or it might even be the reason you connected with family again. I, I just want to say thank you so much. 200 episodes is a big deal, and um, I'm very grateful. So um, if you're watching out there on YouTube, please hit that subscribe button. And if you got to have more, then check out the Patreon. It's called The Honeydew With Y'all. And I tell you every week, I highlight the lowlights with y'all, and y'all have the wildest fucking stories every week i am blown away by the shit and the inbox is ridiculous all right so if you or someone you know has a story that has to be heard please submit it to honeydewpodcast at gmail.com um if you sign up for a year you're saving over a month it's only five bucks there's no other levels layers any of that shit all right um i'm on tour right now go to ryansickler.com for all your tickets there you go oh chicago november 11th and 12th and grand rapids uh december 9th and 10th all right so chicago we're doing friday saturday grand rapids same thing all right that's the biz. You guys know what we do over here. We highlight the low lights. I always say these are the stories behind the storytellers. And I am very excited to have this guest on today. First time here on the Honeydew. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Jody Sweeten. Welcome hey. to the Honeydew, Jody. Hello, hello. Very excited to have you here. Why, thank you. I am very excited to be here. I am. I really want uh, Honeydew right now because it's just, that's all really I like see behind it? you. I actually really do like Honeydew. Do you? I do. Yeah, these are all fan submitted pictures. Of My Honeydew? favorite's the cigarette. The cigarette out. one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just, right. And then there's like the spoon. Just someone. Sh- it's I don't, all yeah. le- nobody wants it. Nobody wants it. Nobody wants it. I actually do like it. It's all really, right. yeah. Well, then you're definitely welcome here. Why, thank you. Um, thank you for being our guest on episode 200 My here. pleasure. I didn't um, realize I was going to be here for such a, a big occasion. Yeah, we were excited. I hope I don't make it, uh, I hope I don't fuck this up for you're you. You're not going to fuck it up. Uh, you'd be you surprised. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Um, all right, before we get into whatever we're going to get into, will you yes. please plug and promote everything and anything mm. you would like? Yes, yes, yes. Um, let's see. I have my podcast, Never Thought I'd Say This, uh, which has five seasons out. We're taking a short hiatus, and then we're coming back at the beginning of next year, and we're going to start doing two-hour monthly specials. Um, so you can check that out, Never Thought I'd Say This, at Jody Sweeten across all socials. It's S-W-E-E-T-I-N. Um, what else am I working on right now? I've got a couple holiday movies coming out, a Hallmark movie coming out October 28th. Uh, and then a Lifetime Christmas movie, Merry Swissmas, coming out on November 5th, I want to say. Hell yeah. November 5th. Uh, yeah, so I've got a couple of movies premiering. Um, I am hoping to direct one either later this year or beginning of next 
Uh, I am working on some comedy stuff. I do a, a monthly show called the SDSC show that's all online. We have fans from all over the world. It's stand-ups and we do comedy and games and all kinds of fun stuff. So check that out too, sdscshow.com. Um, and it's like fun, ridiculous comedy. Uh, so yeah, I've, I'm sure I've got other things that I will remember. I'm working on a, a theater project right now um, with a group of, uh, of incredible people uh, uh, people and yeah so i'm i'm just kind of trying to dig into some creative stuff right now it's exciting very good yeah, yeah. and i love that you um I, you know i forget that you work with saget so of course you have comedy roots and I do. that's how i met you i met you at the comedy store just yeah. what a couple weeks ago yeah or like a week ago maybe yeah, I don't like, even oh remember. my right so much life happens right. in a week now but yeah i think it was like a week ago yeah and you and your friend came backstage and hung out you guys were super cool and uh yeah i'm really grateful that you came i'm i'm really grateful to be here i always love trying to help people and share my story and well, maybe make it funny and let's laugh talk at about your story because i i want to know yeah everything i want to this is a life story episode so Oof. start where the beginning where are you originally from mom dad brothers right. sisters <clears throat> um i was born here in los angeles i was born uh actually at downtown usc county hospital i was born to uh, a woman named barbara who was in jail at the time I was born. Is that right? Yes. Wait, so were you delivered in prison or uh, jail? On, on whatever their, floor of the USC hospital. County Hospital. The, okay. the one downtown, the, the general hospital, that one, that was where I was born. So they took her out of jail they, they to take have them the out. Baby. They had the baby, right. And then you're... Hold on. There, this is <laughs> not... Trust, you're going to... I'm Holy not even kidding. You're going to need like a notepad. Okay. Right. And, and okay. it, my family tree is sort of a bush <laughs> that's it, like interconnected. <laughs> and so... Okay, I'll shut the fuck just, up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, and it's it's all in my book, Unsweetened, which came out in 2009. Uh, and I keep getting asked if I'm going to write another book. And I don't know. There's something stirring in my head that I might. So anyway, um, I was born uh, to a woman named Barbara uh, at USC County Hospital. Uh, I was taken home by um, a friend of hers and a friend of um, the person of of my biological dad's. Um, her name was Cindy. <clears throat> my biological dad uh, was in jail at the time. John, excuse me, he was in prison at the time. He was at Soledad Prison um, for bad checks and drugs. Uh, he was sent to a maximum security prison uh, because the minimum security was overcrowded. He was supposed to be moved. Uh, I was about nine months old, I believe, when this happened. Uh, he was supposed to be moved a couple weeks later, uh, and a prison riot broke out, and he was stabbed in the heart and killed. No. Uh, yes. So um, he was obviously out of the picture, um, but his family had uh, taken me in. My mom was still in jail, sort of in and out. Why um, was she in jail? She, you know? Drugs and okay. uh, bad checks. They all kind of got wrapped up in some stupid shit. Um, and... You know, I, I, so that was where I started. Um, and then Cindy, the woman who brought me home from the hospital, uh, who is my biological dad's cousin. Okay. Cindy's dad, Sam, uh, is my adopted dad. Okay. Sam, my dad, would come and check on Cindy and his ex wife who had some mental health issues and make sure that everything was. Okay, that there were groceries. There were, you know, he sort of was was in and out. He and my mom had already been married, and they wanted kids. And um, I was my my mom at the time was not able to take care of me, and so they wound up adopting me. So um, technically, I'm my my dad's <laughs> my dad's kids from his first marriage are by blood my cousin, but by adoption my half siblings. Okay. Right. So that's sort of the weird little, yeah. Um, sometimes you need a map. But um, I came, my 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 parents, my mom and dad, Sam and Janice, um, are wonderful, wonderful people. And I was, I, I fell into an incredible life that I, I know I would not have had otherwise. Um, I could have very easily been in the system. I could have very easily... Mm -hmm. Um, just wound up bouncing from house to house, foster care, um, which was what my biological mom did. She was on her own by the time she was 15. So I was fortunate. I wound up in an incredibly loving home with wonderful parents. And uh, I was bright. I was I was smart. 
Um, and so, you know, my my dad saw that my mom wasn't able to take care of me. They adopted me. And um, my mom was a stay-at-home mom. My dad was a uh, superintendent at a gypsum plant in Long Beach Harbor, which okay. is what drywall is made out of. He started working there when he was like 17, 18 years old and worked his way up to superintendent. My dad came from, uh, he was born in 1934 in Oklahoma, um, came from a no electricity, no running water home wow. with eight brothers and sisters and lived in the Central Valley as a migrant farm worker as a kid. Uh, he was an Oki migrant uh, in the 40s and worked his way up and became superintendent of a gypsum plant with very limited education. So I, I my dad, um, my dad has done a lot and seen a lot. And um, my mom was an incredible stay-at-home mom, and she would she got me reading. She got me doing all of these creative things that I just love to do, and I really excelled at. And then, you know, by the time I was three, I was reading books um, and able to memorize things and loved performing and loved dancing and told my mom I wanted to be a performer. I wanted to be a modeler. That was what I called it. Okay. Mommy, I want to be a modeler. And, um, what was it that you saw or what, what I, resonated with you that planted that seed for you? Uh, was that I anything? loved, I mean, I was the kid, I was an only child growing up. I was a, the kid who would find a harmonica and run into the middle of the room while my mom and grandma and aunt were having a conversation and be like, and now, like stomping on my feet, doing a whole thing, yeah. twirl around and be like, and thank you. And then I'd leave. And you're like, out. Right. So just let her it have was it. just, let her right. have it. my yeah. first dance recital, I was like one row back and the bitch in front of me was like fucking it up. So I was like, look, you got it. And I pushed her out of the way and I got it to the front. So my mom was like, maybe she likes to perform. Okay. Uh, and and was like, you know, what the hell? Like, let, okay, put you in some print ads and maybe a couple commercials, you know, what's going to come of it? And um, and now I'm 40 years old and I've been in this business since I was four, four. off and on. I mean, I've, I've had stints in like, you know, quote unquote, the normal world. I worked in drug and alcohol treatment for a while. Um, I worked at a school for a while. Did you? Yeah. Doing what? Uh, my actually, my undergrad degree is in liberal studies with an emphasis in elementary education okay. and an, a history minor. So I was going to be an elementary school teacher. That's what I got my my bachelor's in, and I worked at a school um, after I graduated. Very nice. Yeah. So there's my my story has a lot of offshoots and a lot of different. Uh, well, let's jump back to, to four because you okay. said at four you actually get a do you actually get a a paid job at four? I did. I was four. doing commercials. I was doing. Uh, I did a Sizzler commercial. I did an Oscar Mayer commercial. Sizzler, yeah. Um, the Sizzler commercial actually went so well. Uh, I, I, there was a little boy that was there who was supposed to be doing it. And they had me do it, and then I just took over for him. And so they actually called me Jody in the commercial because they didn't even have a name written for me. It was Brad, I think, was the original. And I wound up doing this all-you-can-eat fried shrimp commercial. Oh, my God. Let me tell you. If I never ate fried shrimp again for, like, fucking years after that. It ruined um, you at four. But the, it ruined me at four against fried shrimp. And Sizzler, really. Um, yeah, for real. But <laughs> although, let's, I mean, for real, like, Sizzler really ruined me on Sizzler. So, um, yeah. but at four, I did a commercial for their all-you-can-eat shrimp. Uh, and BBDNO, which was a huge ad company at the time that worked for them, uh, gave me a dog because this, it was such a successful commercial. You got and a I dog? And I added so much to it. They wanted to know what I, what in the world I could possibly want that would make me happy. They asked my mom and she was like, she really wants a dog. What kind of dog did you get? It's a little Lhasa Apso. We named I her, had a Lhasa. I named her Lacey uh, okay. after Lee Lacey, who was the director of the commercial. Um, yeah, so that was my- Did you have the hair all the way down? No, I we kept her cut. short. Yeah, and my, yeah, I feel but that dog would spent, she spent time outside more than I'd like. And I, I feel bad about that. Like my dad was not the dog person that my mom and I have forced him to be now. So, um, Good. but anyway, uh, yeah, at four years old, I did that. I started working and then I got, uh, a guest appearance on a show called Valerie. I don't know if you remember that I show remember with Valerie, Valerie Harper yeah. and, uh, I was playing the next door neighbor 
I was playing her niece. So I was playing Pamela Poole. I was Mrs. Poole's niece. Um, and she comes over and hurts her back. And then suddenly the three boys have to take care of me. Jason Bateman, Jeremy Licht, and um, oh my gosh, I can't, it feels terrible. I'm forgetting the third one's name. Any, uh, Danny, P- no, Danny something. Anyway. Um, <laughs> and how old are you at this time? Uh, not, I like f- almost five. Oh, wow. You're still four. Still four, Jeez. almost five. And um, I did this episode of the show and the producers, it was the same producers that were creating Full House at the time. It was Miller Boyette who have done Happy Days and Laverne and Shirley and Valerie and Mega. all of that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and they loved what I did with Pamela Poole. Uh, and they cast me as Stephanie. I never auditioned for the part. No way. Um, it was, they knew from seeing me do that, that it was exactly what they wanted. And um, I was one of the first people cast. And that was it. And from that moment on, you know, my life became very, very different. So tell me about it. How are you? I mean, you're five and you land Full House at five. Yeah. I mean, and you know, Full House was not successful the first at the season. We did not know. Is that right? Oh, yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Critics hated our show. Critics have always hated our show. It's not. We we, we realize like, look, we're we're not doing this for critics. We're doing this for our fans. Mm. And um, once we got families watching, like after those first 13 episodes, um, it started really growing. And then it became like a really, really successful show. Here's a wild question. Over eight years. Okay, so... You starting at five, looking back now as an adult, when do you realize like this thing's turning into something much bigger? I don't know that I ever did. It never. People weren't stopping you on well, the street. Well, they were. That was stuff. the thing. People were stopping me on the street. And you're or I'd a go to kid, a too. I'd go to like a mall appearance. I remember a mall appearance in Des Moines, Iowa that they I had to dress up as a boy and escape from because too many people showed up at the mall and the fire marshal had to shut it down. It was like 10,000 people at this mall. No. And they had to sneak me out Holy in a police shit. car. That's an arena. <laughs> and, yeah, and like, it was ridiculous. And I think about these things and I'm like, that was my life, like at, you know, 10 or 11. And I remember it was on the news, the Des Moines news. And I was so sad because people were angry that oh, I that wasn't there. Show. Uh, that angry that I left. And I remember I as a kid, I was like, but I had to. Like, they told me I had. You know, and it, I was so upset that I couldn't have my side of this. Like, they they, they couldn't hear my side. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I had I, I knew it was a big thing, but I never – I also lived a very grounded life at home. I didn't grow up in L.A. proper. I grew up right outside of L.A. in Orange County. Um, my dad still worked at a gypsum plant for a while and then he retired and then he was a handyman um you know my mom was with me on set all the time okay she was like you know with me every day drove me to set if i had to travel she was there she was you know i guess my manager um she was the one that was with me all the time um and so my mom and i had a really close relationship growing up um but I wanted to – I loved doing what I did. And my parents always said, like, if you love this, we'll support you. If you stop loving this and you don't want to do this, like, we, you know, tell us. Um, my parents were never, like, pushy, go, you know, go perform for us. Um, I think my mom – I mean, I was in pageants when I was little and stuff. My mom definitely loved – um, the performance, the dress up aspect, all that, but she was never like the pushy stage mom. She was right. like, let me just blend into the background. I just want to make sure my kid's okay. Um, and that kept me really normal. You know, I went to public school. I had normal. You did the yeah, whole time. Okay. Yeah. I had normal friends. You know, most of the, a lot of the friends at my birthday parties were just kids from school. But how would you do that? What was your work week like? Because uh, I'm work sure week, you're you're such a child that they've got to protect you and not work you. What God? Well, what are you, you allowed to work was, a five year old? My well, at the first season, I seem to remember we did all, schooling on set and stuff, and then we'd work three weeks and have a week off. Mm. So then I'd go to regular school and stuff. But but later on in the seasons, and I can't remember exactly when. I want to say like 
fourth grade, maybe third, fourth grade, um, maybe even earlier, they started letting me go to school in the morning. So I, we would work a four-day week. Uh, Mondays, I would be in school as a regular day. Tuesdays and Wednesdays, I would go to school till lunch. My mom would pick me up. And at that time, traffic was doable that you could drive from Orange County to Culver yeah. City in, you know, 45 minutes and and make it at noon. Um, yeah, you <laughs> and you ain't doing that shit anymore. <laughs> you're not. Um, and just, you're not fucking you're happening. Not. Right. So, like, God bless those times. Uh, and I was able to go to school in the morning and then I would go rehearse in the afternoon, do rehearsal and run through and then, you know, homework in the car or whatever. And, and then Thursday and Friday are tape days. I did schooling on set. Okay. Or I could bank hours on rehearsal days so that th- those would count towards the, you know, if I had a big episode to film or something on Thursday or Friday. So it was a balance of both. And I am so grateful for that because I always had a foot in normal life. My parents were normal people. My parents, we didn't, they didn't give a shit about going to Hollywood parties. And, you know, it was like just a regular existence. Yeah. And it was a break from the crazy of, you know, going, going, going all the time. And are you exclusive to Full House during that time? Or are you allowed to do anything else? No, during that time, Full House took up most of my, Mm -hmm. most of my time because, um, you know, we shot like nine months out of the year. We at that time net, network shows were doing yeah. twenty four to twenty six episodes, yeah, not six right? Six or seven, right? Yeah, right. Yeah. It wasn't this Netflix right. like you know limited series eight, um, but you know it was twenty four to twenty six episodes a season. So you were working three weeks, you were off a week, you were off for you know a little while at the holidays, and then sort of late spring, early summer you had off, and then you went back to work. So, you know, it was, that was the schedule. And that was what I did for eight years. Eight years. So from five to about 13. 13, yeah. And as you're getting older, like, are you, what what are you seeing differently in the industry as you get older? Like, we hear about all these kids who are child actors who get taken advantage of and right. all that. But you've got your mom there. You know, I, like, I was really, really fortunate in that. Everyone on our set, our entire cast, Bob, Dave, John, yeah, Lori, um, our directors, our producers, everyone was kind, you know, um, at least to the kids. I mean, I'm sure there was bullshit that happens at work, you know, whatever, but it was a real family. So w- the adults on set looked out for us. If they noticed, like, we were kind of, they were like, hey, can we take a five? Can we, you know? Oh, good. So if they saw were, you tired. They, saw, or... they were aware of us. I, we spent time together outside of just work. We were a family unit and still are, which I'm so grateful for. But, you know, it was not um, like, yeah, there were things that I missed. And I'm I'm sort of going through this moment right now in my life where I'm like, okay, well, it wasn't all it, it wasn't all good and it wasn't all bad like there were some really wonderful things about it and i had a great experience compared to some other people Mm -hmm. um but there were definitely things that it took away from my childhood and the anonymity that i lost at such a young age and things like that okay so let's you know processing that too but i'm just I, i i grew up in an environment that we were laughing all the time Comedy was a huge piece of my life and how I lived day to day was around stand-up comedians and listening to them and just having fun with them. Um, And so I I am so glad that I had that because I know I had a very different experience than a lot of kids in this business. And it really shaped me, for sure. So what – what do you start seeing? Like, what age are you exposed to drugs, alcohol? I mean, I have people sit across from me, talk to me about six, seven, eight, and they're not in entertainment. Right. Oh, that's So this see, shit comes fast out here. Yeah, but you know what? I entered all of that completely away from the world of entertainment. Is that right? Oh, yeah. I was not around it. Um, you know, maybe I would have, like— a glass of champagne. I think we'd go to the Palm restaurant and, you know, at like 13 when I would get to go out with all the adults after a show, we'd go to the Palm and I'd finally that eighth season would get included and like I'd get a glass of champagne. But, you know, they'd pour it for a 13 year old. They would. Um, huh? Yeah. Uh, but as far as that kind of stuff, we didn't, it, that wasn't the environment of our set. That wasn't the, I mean, you know, 
it just wasn't around us. They were conscientious of of the kids. I started getting into that in high school. In high school. With, you know, other stupid but kids. But after the show. So 13 it ends. 13 it ends. And then what and do eighth you do? Grade, 13 it ends. Eighth grade I end. I start high school. I start high school. I turn, I turn 13 because um, – I was 13 when I started high school. I was a year ahead of everybody. I'd skipped a grade in, in elementary. Um, so I was younger than people. Uh, I was now a full-time student. I was in a theater program, a musical theater program, <clears throat> the Orange County High School for the Arts. Um, but I now was also like just a normal kid. And now all of a sudden that routine that kept me really busy is gone. And... Um, it was a huge adjustment. Like there was something that was nice about it where it was like there was nothing extra expected of me. I just didn't, I didn't have to go anywhere all the time. I didn't have to, I could just be at school. Um, but at the same time, you know, I started reala like realizing, okay, I don't, I don't know how I fit into this. I don't know. I just, I just want to be normal like everyone else. Um, Are you playing sports? Are you in wasn't theater? Wasn't playing sports. I was in you? theater. Okay. Um, my my you know my regular school hours went until like one thirty p.m. and then from one thirty to about five p.m. every day we did our theater program. So again, I still had long days. I'm still involved in theater and performance. Um, but I was a kid too. I was in high school and I was doing stupid shit that high school kids do. Um, except for the fact that you know addiction runs in my biological history. And so for me, when I pick up a drink, it does something very different than it does for everyone else. And how quickly did you realize that? I realized that pretty early on. I remember, I seem to remember at like 15, writing some overly dramatic poem, which I know now, oh God, if I want to find those fucking books so bad because I know there's like ridiculous poems of, you know, that need to be on Mortified. Have you ever listened to that podcast? Oh, uh, no, but that's a great idea. Yeah, Mortified yeah. is just people getting up and read. It's brilliant. Oh. It's so brilliant because it's poignant and it's hilarious. But and you know, at that time when they wrote that, they were it, right, in and it was it. They in it. There's in ones it. about people yeah. like I'm in love yeah. with the waiter at Olive yeah. Garden, and I know he loves me too, and he, you know, and like that stupid shit when you're yeah. twelve, you're like, oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I told <laughs> for real, like the dude in the Froyo place loved me, right? You're like eleven with a stupid crush, but like I know somewhere in those books, I I wrote down like that I was an alcoholic. You and, did at yeah. fifteen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. I knew, I I knew like. For me, it was – there was no off switch. So it runs biologically. Did your parents your yes. have – did they have issues yes, with alcohol? Yes, both of – yeah. But as far as I know, my, my mom did uh, and my dad had issues with alcohol. And then it just runs it, it, throughout that biological family, which I know of because I know through my adopted dad I can ask, you know, um, mm -hmm. uh, relatives. So in that regard, I'm, I was fortunate. But I think – and I've talked about this before. There was like a part of me that because that was – gosh, I'm just getting very raw today. Um, because that was what I knew about them, that was the story I had been told. That was my way to connect with them and that was that was oh. the story that I told myself. I, I think see. That, I, that that was what I was. Um, and I think it, you know, wasn't – I mean, we'll get to that point after I had my daughter, but um, the forgiveness it took me a long time to for find the forgiveness in myself uh, and in m my my biological mom. I think a lot of adoptees feel like that, that even if they know they wound up in a much better situation, like somehow there's that level of rejection. Yeah, I wasn't good enough or right. you gave or, me right, away. Right, right, right. Yeah. Um, and so I had to, I think that was a big piece of what I was working through, honestly. And I always say that I would have had struggles with alcohol and drugs regardless of being in television. I know for myself, the way that I react to it had nothing to do with the fact that I was on TV. That was all an internal thing that would have happened regardless. But because I was on TV, everyone knew about it. I see. So, you know what I mean? It was like it it and 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 it added a layer of obvious weirdness to my life that I'm sure I was seeking to figure out with drugs and alcohol. Um 
So, you know, it, it, it was around 13 I started drinking. And then, you know, in high school, I was like, I would drink in class. I would in be— In class? Oh, yeah, How'd yeah, yeah. How'd you do that? I would just have a big coffee mug um, that was like Kahlua and coffee. And I would just sit in class and, and drink it. But I was getting good grades, and teachers liked me. Mm -hmm. And so I was able to, um, you know, I could, I could play it off. I could act. Um, I could pretend. And nobody knew. I could keep up this facade, and that was something what that made I, you think that's ballsy to bring it into class. There was something I I have always uh, well to be honest I've always been one that's like what are the rules? Fuck okay, those fuck rules. those rules, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, so yeah. I I that's part of it is like oh wait this is a police station I'm gonna get high in the police station, um, which I may or may not have done. Anyway, um, but, you know, like, that's just part of who I am is like the, like, you know what, let's, fuck it. Like, let's try this. And so that was where I was. And I think I was also, I just wanted so desperately to not be famous at school. I just wanted to walk by and not hear whispers of conversation about me. You know, one of the things that you learn in 12-step programs and all this stuff is, you know, and you're like, people are not thinking about you. But in my case, a lot of times people they were, were. Yeah, I could see that for sure. I would, show, I would go to a new school and 40 kids would follow me around and half of them were being nice and half of them weren't. This is what I wanted to ask you. I imagine that makes it really hard to figure out who is – authentic and who isn't and it's probably yeah. very difficult to make real friends in high school after coming off of a show like that I, you know it is but i will say um i don't know if i'm maybe stupidly optimistic or um maybe just a little dumb but i always believe the best in people so i come i i come to most people with a pretty open heart um and I've gotten burned a lot and I've I've trusted a lot of the wrong people, but I try to not let that stop me from being who I am. Um, and yeah, I mean, people are shitty. People are shitty in high school. I was shitty in high school. I did really, you know, I did really shitty things to people and hurt people's feelings because I was, you know, 15 and an asshole. I have a 14-year-old now, by the way, and the, nothing has changed. They're still all <laughs> self <-adaptable. laughs> Uh, I love my daughter to death, but like, you know, you're just like, there is a world around you, child. And I go, oh, yeah, my mom said that to me too. Um, but, you know, I just, I desperately wanted to be like everyone else. And so it was like, let me be badder than you. Let me be bolder than you. But let me also be smarter than you and get away with shit because I got to keep up that facade too in order to get what I want. You know what I mean? Like it was a it was a lot. And I like I've only recently I think in my like late 30s and now 40 have started like pulling the threads apart. Isn't it wild? It's fucking crazy. It I mean, never and I, like stops. I'm in a, I'm if you're actually really working on yourself it never stops. I, it's true and I'm in a real period. I'm excited to do this show cuz I'm in this real period of um growth and um like creativity and trying new things and being open and raw and honest and just kind of who exactly who I am and let radical self-acceptance. So um, it's exciting to get to come on a show like this and, you know, talk about who you really are well, and, let, you. and figure it out along the way. Cause yeah. like, fuck, if you're really doing it, it's like you said, it's, you're always just like, also, Oh, you're no. not right every time either. No. You're like, Oh fuck. I was wrong about that. Or you like, you do <laughs> yeah, something like, and you're it. like, Oh, that, Oh <laughs> did God. Did all that work for nothing. That, did that, right. That was terrible. <laughs> right. That backfired. <laughs> Yeah, and it's and like it's such a process, and being um, being patient with ourselves That's in that it. process because I am an impatient person, and I my yeah I want my biggest now. challenge now. in therapy is that I will show up week to week and be like, you know, I'm sorry that we're still on this thing about like my childhood, and she's like, it's been three weeks, like you're not gonna, and I'm like, I know, but I should be over it by now, <laughs> and she's like, That's. Not how this works, you mm -hmm. know. So I, yeah, I expect instant results, and yeah. uh, that's not 
It's not how self-discovery no, works, guys. it sure isn't. It takes a long time to fuck you up, and it takes a long time, time to, to get unfuck out. yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah just as long as it takes to get yourself wrapped up in it. Liquid IV fuels your well-being with easy ways to stay hydrated. Every day I've been hitting the gym now, I drop my Liquid IV right in that bottle, shake it up, take it with me, stay hydrated all day. One stick of Liquid IV in 16 ounces of water hydrates you two times faster and more efficiently than water alone. It contains five essential vitamins, B3, B5, B6, B12, and vitamin C, and with three times the electrolytes of traditional sports drinks. It's made with premium ingredients, non-GMO, and free from gluten, dairy, and soy. To date, Liquid IV has donated over 25 million servings in 50-plus countries around the world. Grab your Liquid IV in bulk nationwide at Costco or get 15% off when you go to liquidiv.com and use the code HONEYDO at checkout. That's 15% off of anything you order when you shop Better Hydration today using promo code HONEYDO at liquidiv.com. That's promo code HONEYDO at liquidiv.com. You ever get the feeling that someone's watching you, like even when there's no one else in the room? Now, I know you're probably thinking it's Halloween season. I'm just being paranoid, but this is actually real. Every single day, there's actually someone watching your every move. The worst part is you're even paying them to spy on you. That someone is your internet service provider. Every website you visited late at night, how much time you spent on each, they're keeping tabs on you. And that's why I use ExpressVPN. If you use the internet, we all do. ExpressVPN is an app that you just need to be using. Internet service providers are legally allowed to sell all their users' browsing activity to advertisers. With ExpressVPN, 100% of your traffic is rerouted through their encrypted servers so no one can see a thing. My favorite part is ExpressVPN is so simple to use. You just open up the app, you tap the button, and that's it. ExpressVPN works on all your devices, whether you browse the internet on your phone, tablet, computer. You can use up to five devices at the same time under one ExpressVPN subscription. Look, I want to say this. I travel the continent. I travel the country. I'm constantly using it to get sports in different cities. Uh, in Canada, we used it to, to for payments and things. So stop letting people invade your privacy. Right now, get three extra months of ExpressVPN for free when you go to expressvpn.com slash honeydew. That's expressvpn.com slash honeydew. Expressvpn.com slash honeydew to learn more. Now, let's get back to the do. All right, so when you're drinking in high school, are you drinking with friends, or is this like a thing you're just doing? Both. Okay. Both. I would drink with friends, but I was always the one that was like, oh, boy. You know what I mean? Um, I, but I drink everybody under the table. Uh, I had no off switch, and I all, it was like, let's the stupid ideas abound. Can you know I what ask I mean? you, I, I sit across from people who tell me they're alcoholics and and because I, I can have a beer, I can have half a beer and leave it. And they're like, I can't. That's, no, what's the point? And they say like, if I have one, I'm going to have 20. And they're, they'll say, that's not an exaggeration. Oh, so yeah. is it I, like that for you? You don't have an off switch? I, you the, know what I realized with alcohol is that for me, it um, – it just triggers something to where there's like, there's no off switch. And when I look at it, you know, one of the things that it talks about in the literature of, of 12 step books is it says, you know, our, our goal is to drink like a gentleman. It's an outdated book. It's from the thirties, but <laughs> uh, you know, our goal is to drink like a gentleman. I, and I had to get real honest with myself and in my program. And when I really came to the conclusion that like, Oh, I don't want to drink like a gentleman. I want to get to obliterated as quickly as possible or right to the edge of it to where I'm at least still upright. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. that, I want to get there and stay there when I drink. And so once I realized that, it was a much clearer thing where I was like, oh, yeah, it's not appealing to me. The, a glass of wine isn't appealing to me because, because I, that's not a glass to me. That's three bottles in. Because that's where we're going to go. So so when do drugs enter then? If alcohol's 13, when do drugs come in? I mean, probably like 14, 15, smoking pot on the way to school. You know, um, it wasn't until I like graduated. My, my grad night of high school was the first time I ever tried uh, ecstasy. Okay. That was the first night. 
that I did anything like harder than smoking pot. And I, I smoked pot and I never really liked it. When I was in high school, I don't know why it would make me really dizzy and like puke. I, it was just puke, was, really. Yeah, it was never oh. like I didn't love it in high school. Um, and so, anyway, so that that was the first time I I did that, and then I was like, that was awesome. Um, and you know, I was going through a lot of drinking at that time. I my parents were really worried about What's me. What's a lot? What was a day for I you? I mean, well, I, my parents didn't know, but it was like it wasn't even like a daily thing. It was just like if I had an opportunity to go out of the house or go out with friends, I was doing something fucking stupid. Like the cops brought me home one night. I lost my brand new car one night. You mean lost it? Well, I gave it to a friend of mine okay. uh, who actually had a suspended license who wound up driving it to San Diego and returning it two days later. But I didn't know that because when I handed him the keys, I was. In such a blackout that I didn't remember who I handed my keys to. <laughs> and enough. it All was right. a brand new BMW. Oh, so yeah, shit. this is this is the shit that I do. Like, like lay down in the middle of the street, traffic it lanes like that stupid fucking movie. Mm -hmm. Like that's the kind of the shit program, I do. Uh-huh. Yeah. Like, oh, let me stand on the, you know, ledge of a seven-story balcony and see if I can bet. Like that's you, the stupid you shit. Did I, that? I've Stuff done like that. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That in my 20s. That's the stupid shit that I do because I. So it's more than just getting drunk then. Oh, it's for, also the risk that, of bodily in death. Yeah, I think it was, um, you know, for me drinking and using um, it, and it started then at like 17, 18. Um, I really started getting heavy into my drinking and using. I. um would occasionally get cocaine and ecstasy, but again, mostly just alcohol. And what was your drink of choice? Whatever you had. It didn't matter. It, so didn't, it wasn't I didn't give a just shit. whiskey or I mean, whiskey, you, I love that, but like, I, you know. Didn't, you didn't care if it was I didn't beer care. or vodka oh, or whatever. Oh, I'd have Bacardi 151 contests. Like, we, you know, Contest. whatever. Yeah, that I don't. When you win that, there's no winning that. There's yeah. not. It's not a win. That it's not, not a win. It's not a situation. win. Three shots of that in a row is not a win for anyone, particularly your intestines. Anyway, um, but you know, by seventeen, eighteen, uh, I had a point nine GPA in school. I was. Whoa, you did, huh? uh, And I was on in on an academic scholarship. I went to a, you know Chapman University. I went to a great school. Um, I was smart, I, you know, but I just didn't go to class. I was just drinking all the time. And my parents, when I graduated high school, my parents were terrified uh, of me going because I was getting into so much trouble. And um, the deal that we struck was, okay, well, I live in the dorms because I, I was like, I have to have the dorm experience. And the goal, the the deal was that I'd stay in the dorms through the week while I was at class. And then on weekends, I would have to come home okay. and be at home. I could go out with friends, but I had to stay at home at my parents' house because it, it was only like 20 minutes away. This was their attempt to this sort was of their like attempt wrangle to, right. you in. So I was like, word. Monday through <laughs> Thursday, party time. Friday, Saturday, we're going to rest up. And that's exactly what I did. And I did not go to any classes. I broke my ankle the third day of school, running down a flight of stairs, um, which then turned into this crazy fucking rumor that I was on acid and thought I could fly and, you know, Jody Sweet Murder. No, I was running down the stairs and I overestimated because I had had a few beers and I snapped my ankle. But I didn't want to, that was at night. I didn't want to get it looked at. So I stuffed it in a tennis shoe and I walked around on it. Uh, I didn't want to admit that I'd broken it. But I wouldn't go to class, but I would certainly go to uh, drink. So that was my priority. And, um, by the time I had entered into, I think it was the second semester of my freshman year of college, um, I was dating the man who would become my first husband, um, and everyone was really worried about me. My roommate, I, I'll never forget my roommate once saying to me, she came in the room, and I was drunk again, people were there, and whatever, and she was just heartbroken because she'd picked me up so many times or come to find me so many times or worried when I disappeared so many times. And she just said, if you take one more drink, like I'm done with you. And I just looked her right in the eye and I was like, cheers, motherfucker, and drank it. And that's the kind of person I am when I drink. And, um, you know, that was where I was at in college. I um, And I've talked briefly about this before, but I started cutting. I was a self-harmer. What made, um, what brought that on? 
I have learned in so many years of therapy, uh, but I have learned that, um, you know, it's, it, it's, it's an outward physical expression of mental pain when you have this overwhelming feeling that you don't, it's like your brain goes, I don't know what to do with this. Like, if this happens, at least I can be like, oh, that hurts. Okay, so it's a, you want to feel something. You want, right. It's okay. like you want to, oh, that, I can do this. And- yeah, yeah. So, you know, I, I never, any, never anything like super deep. I didn't, but I, uh, you know, was almost getting kicked out of the dorms for being a danger to myself. My parents were really worried. Um, I would come home and just sleep for like, you know, 30 hours straight. Um, and I was not doing well. And at that point, I was 18 years old, and um, I was out one night, and um, like I said, the, the guy that I eventually married the first time, uh, he picked me up, and we were driving down PCH somewhere, and we pulled over, and um, and he called my mom, and he handed me the phone, and he was like, you need to talk to your mom. And I was just like, oh, fuck. Okay. And, uh, and that was it. That was the moment that I, I, the first moment, the first moment that I was like, I need help and something's wrong. Okay. <clears throat> and, uh, I went home for a couple weeks. Well, no, it wasn't a couple weeks. It was like a week. Um, and just kind of tried to detox and figure things out. And, um, I decided I was going to move out of the dorms that I just was, it was not the right situation for me. Um, and, I went back to my first class that night and uh, I was taking a class called Western Mysticism and Spirituality, which was this really interesting class taught by this really awesome priest dude. And um, I came back to class that night and that night we just happened to be studying the uh, spiritual principles of the 12 steps and we had two people from Alcoholics Anonymous come show up and tell their story. And... I sat there and it was the first time that I heard the way that I felt in someone else. Interesting. Okay. And she was an older woman and it was this, uh, and her husband, and they were like, you know, in their late fifties, early sixties, they looked nothing like me. I lived a completely different life, but I heard how I felt. And uh, they left that room and I chased them down the hallway and I just turned to her and I said, I need help. And she told me to meet her at a meeting the next day. And that was the very first time I ever went to a 12-step meeting. I was 18 years old. And that was the first time I tried to get sober. Okay. And, uh, you know, it getting sober for me was a process. It was up. It was down. I um, I graduated school. I got married. Like I said, I was- uh, How old were you when you first married? 20 years old when I got young, married first. I was yeah. very young. Um, I thought- I, and my my first husband was a a, a great guy, um, but I was I wasn't done yet. I I I was holding on for everyone else, but I I I had done some of the work, but not deep enough. I, I had some more digging to do to get down a little further, and um, and so you know my twenties, uh, I I I relapsed while I was married. I was married to a police officer. I was doing a lot of drugs and a lot of stupid shit while what married. What drugs him. are you doing? Now? I was doing speed. I was doing ecstasy. I was doing cocaine. I was doing a lot of stuff and hiding it from him. Yeah, a police officer. Yeah, it was. How would you hide it? He worked at night. Ah, uh. he worked at night, so I could go out at night, and then he'd come home and sleep during the day, and then I could go do you know I. I during the day, I would be home doing stuff, whatever. You know, again, um, I, this was one of those things that I've had to look at where I go, oh, I was doing that pretending thing again, where I was getting the, you know, do, being the perfect wife and cooking meals and doing all this stuff and redecorating a house and, you know, getting a job and blah, blah, blah. But I was also over here doing this. You really were. You were able to do that for a while? A couple years. And um, eventually that ended uh, poorly and I just got honest and uh, I went to treatment for the first time and, you know, that was, uh, I was so terrified. I was so terrified. Uh, I was like 22, almost 23 and I was like, I just fucked everything up, like everything. Um, 
but I but I had experience. Like I knew. I remember on the way home from uh, the hospital, um, the night that everything blew up <clears throat> with m- my using and drinking. I remember just saying the serenity prayer over and over again, which is, you know, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. And the entire car ride home, which was a silent car ride with uh, my police officer husband and, um, you know, all of the news, um, I just said that over and over again in my head because I knew that whatever, wherever I was going after this, I, I it was... The decisions had been made. The, the 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 freight train had come crashing down to a, to a halt, and now we pick up the pieces, and it'll be okay. You can do this, you know. And um, and again, I went through treatment, and I was going to work there, and I was a star student and doing great, and then I relapsed, you know. But I hit it, and then I you know, and again, I found I, I have found this element of let me be star student. And then let me, but let me also f- sabotage myself. Um, and, you know, I spent my 20s, I finally was like, fuck this. Like, I left treatment for a while. I was in sober living. I was like, I can get an apartment by myself. This is going to be a great idea. And I relapsed immediately, probably over a dude, because that was also what we were doing in treatment. Because, like, you're bored, so you're just like, you're fucked up. You'll do. Um <laughs> And do. yeah, I mean, look, I've, uh, um, and so, you know, I just, I, I like, I was real messy, went back to treatment, was really angry. I could, I, it's so funny for like years. I, my memory would not bring up the name of the place that I went when I went to treatment the second time. It was like, I blocked that entire time of 30 days out of my mind. And I was like, oh, I had to like go back and really reprocess that and think about it because I, I was just really angry. Um, and then, you know, I and then I, I got divorced, obviously. And then I was out partying and I was going crazy and life was whatever. And then I you met- You just what, in your mid-20s or early 20s? It was my 20s? mid-20s, yeah. 24, 25. I, for a long time, I've talked about this before, didn't expect to see 30. You really, you really, I really, really didn't. Did the not. way I was going, and I don't think anybody around me did either. Um, you know, my parents, my God, my poor parents, um, who loved me through all of it, but who, you know, eventually would hold boundaries and be like, yeah, please don't come to Thanksgiving. Um, you know, I, I was really lucky that I had them there. But I made it, I just blew up every area of my life. Um, and then, you know, and then I, of course, I've met someone else. I met someone and everything's going to be great now. Um, and I knew them for six weeks. And, and then we were with friends and there was like a, you know, someone was like, well, we're going to get married too. I was like, oh, we'll totally do it too. We'll get married. And that was exactly how I made the decision. And then we got married and my parents found out through my agent and it was awful. Within six weeks? Yes. Where did you get married? Like Vegas? Vegas, or? yeah. We got married in Vegas. Um, he is the dad to my older daughter, and he and I get along very well now. Um, we have been through our hell. <laughs> um, and yeah, and that was, you know, we got married, and then I, I and then I got pregnant. And all of a sudden, um, responsibility. Called. Yeah, shit's real now. And I was like, oh, shit, what do I do? You know, I, 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 I had to figure out what I wanted to do, and I... I thought maybe this is maybe this is my opportunity to to do it right to heal something. And so um I you know I went through with it. I was really excited and of course now my daughter's 14 and she's fucking gorgeous and amazing and like I love hanging out with her. Um but it was really overwhelming to go from being a complete fucking mess to having a kid and being Did married you? and living, you know, and we moved out to a house out um, in Corona, which is like, you know, an hour and a half outside of LA. Um, all the friends I had were all like party friends. So I didn't really have anybody. I wasn't working. I, he wasn't working. Like we were just, it was, I was completely overwhelmed, you know, and I started drinking again. Um, and then I, then I knew I had to get sober um, really quickly after that because I, all of a sudden, 
it came full circle to me the resentment and anger and hurt that I had with my biological mom. And all these years that I had spent thinking that it was me or that I wasn't worthy or that like, I don't know, somehow hanging on to some bit of why did you do this? Why did you make me this way? You know, why Why did you pass this stupid fucking gene down to me? Um, and in that moment, I realized that I w wanted to stop drinking and was having a problem and loved my daughter more than anything in the world and nothing changed that. But I also had this problem. And suddenly there was this like level of forgiveness and understanding of someone who was just very, very sick and that I didn't have to be that person. And, uh, and it changed me, you know, being a mom really, really changed me. Um, and did you go cold turkey that first time? Like right when you got pregnant, or did you just stop? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there were a couple, I think I had like a glass of wine here and there, but like it was, you know, it went from like fucking let's rage this shit to like, <laughs> right, yeah. oh, what? Right. Yeah, it, you know, and people were definitely long? surprised. People were like, you're doing what? <laughs> they, didn't, yeah, they doubted you, huh? Well, I, the people I was hanging out with were like, oh, so you're not gonna, so I shouldn't call you to get high now. And you're like, no, no. You know, and it was like, well, what do I do on a Tuesday night? Like, I was going out to clubs. Like, what, you know, life got very different. Um, and I'm so grateful for it. It, I, it saved me. I probably saw 30 because of it. Um, and, and, it, and I had a whole different perspective. Now, things didn't work out with her dad and I. We split when uh, she was about four and a half months old. Um, that didn't work out. It was ugly for a while. Now we're cool and we're friends and we like laugh about like, remember when I fucking hated you? Uh, <laughs> um, which I hope everyone can get to that point with it their ex when you can be, be nice. like, remember when you were that asshole and I did this and you did that? It was really shitty. Like, ah, yeah, man. Or like, you know, somebody something will happen and we'll be like, oh, I didn't, I, I didn't slash your tires. Swear to God. Um, <laughs> yeah, you got to defend yourself. Right, you like, know, that wasn't me. It, like, <laughs> yeah. I, I may, may everyone get to that point in a in, with their ex because he and I can travel together and show up for our daughter and it's amazing Good. and I'm really proud That's of great. that. Yeah. Um, you know, we may have our differences and whatever, but I know at, at the end of the day, like from what that was and how we met and how fucked up I was at the time and everything, we've done pretty damn well and we got a great kid, Yeah, you know? Yeah. Um, and so, uh, but at, you know, after that, obviously I was like, okay, I was divorced. That's not happening. And that was like two, like two years later and, you know, I met somebody else. <laughs> and of course, this is the thing that's going to fix it. And this is the, Can you I know. ask you real quick? That yeah. was, uh, I know you did that so quick, but did you get it annulled or did you No, actually... no. It, we we okay. went through a divorce. It was ugly. It was custody. Okay. It was no fun. It was articles in the paper. Uh -huh. It was, you know, all of the bullshit. Um, it was expensive. Um, you know, it was all of those things. Uh, it, was, it was as ugly as divorce can be, uh, plus you know, public and TMZ bullshit. Um, and because it was so close to, you know, um, dealing with my addiction and my treatment and because in some of the, you know, divorce proceedings, it was talking about me trying to get sober, like it was this salacious thing. So it was, you know, it was no fun. Um, and then anyway, I met someone else. Uh, I was sober, things were going well, and we had been together for a while. And, you know, again, I, I got pregnant and we were like, you know, maybe we don't have to get married. I don't know. Maybe we do. We were, I was like, I'm okay with it. We don't have to. We don't have to yet. Um, and I got my adorable daughter, B, who um, came out like a little fuzzy peach. And she is this interesting, creative, wonderful girl. Um, and, you know, her dad and I then eventually got married and it was, it was, we were kind of like, well, I mean, insurance is coming. We should do this. I mean, we got a kid. Like, I guess, you know, why not? Um, again, also not great reasons to get married. Um, and, you know, and it's, we, we were together. It was, it worked at the time. And I think I realized I never asked myself the right questions when I got into relationships. Like what? I was actually just talking about this today. 
that uh, I whatever I wanted didn't matter. It was I knew I could put my needs aside to make someone else happy. So I wasn't going to make any demands or ask any questions or have any needs or wants because I, I can push mine to the side and it's easier to make someone else happy. And I did that a lot. Um, and, you know, I did that. And then unfortunately, I wound up in situations where I was really unhappy. And that wasn't the other person's fault. You know, they didn't know, like, I, you know, they have no idea. I, I read somewhere, too, that women break up with men in their heads six months before they actually leave. <laughs> six months? Is that the is That, that the shit wrong is way? so true. <laughs> Let me fucking tell you. Every, I will tell you. I'm thinking you this, back to mine think about now, Every time right now, every time, every time, time <laughs> someone has ever, a woman ever has broken up with you, they've been looking at you for six months going, this motherfucker. <laughs> fucking hate when he cheats like that it's my come. god it's yeah come. and then they're like but i can't leave yet because i got this guy oh, we're going on that trip in june fuck all right you know what i'm gonna stay okay i'm gonna stay i'm gonna stay but fuck this guy and you're playing emotional invisible hangman and like maybe if i'm being nice i'm giving you no some idea. shoes and i got no fucking clue yeah, and i'm like know. okay fine you get a shoelace <laughs> You know what I mean? And then finally, I'm just like, that's it. I'm done. Fuck this. Let's burn it to the ground. And, you know, the other person's like, huh? What just happened? Um, and, you know, and and again, I wound up divorced and I was working in treatment. And I had now I had two kids and now I had no money. And I managed to be getting divorced while I was working in treatment. Um, I had to be out of the condo that we shared um, into someplace else, the treatment center that I worked at got taken over by one of the investors. I got fired. I had no money. I ha had an old car that, um, you know, his dad had given me, uh, and I had no idea what I was going to do. And um, the owners of, I, I was living in one of the bottom apartments of uh, one of the sober livings with my kids when all this happened. I lost my job and everything, and suddenly I so then you lose your place had, too. I suddenly oh, had lost my place. I suddenly lost my job. I mean, I was making you know twenty two hundred dollars a month. Um, I lost my job. I lost that. I was in the middle of an ugly divorce. Um, I had two kids, and I had no idea what I was going to do. And how old are you at this point? This was when I was thirty. You've lived one? Like 10 fucking lifetimes before that. Yeah. Jesus. It was like 31. I'm 40 now. So this is, you know, within the last 10 years of yeah. my life. Um, and, you know, and, and I wound up landing, a, a dear friend of mine wound up leaving his apartment and going somewhere else. He was like, I'm going to be gone for three months. Take my place. And I wound up landing in this little apartment building with my kids in this other person's apartment with stuff in storage. And suddenly an apartment opened up across the way. And I begged my parents to co-sign for it. I had terrible credit because I owed like $100,000 to the government for from back taxes that I was still trying to pay off. Uh, my credit was like 300 something. <laughs> Legit. That's, yeah. It was not, it wasn't bad laugh. credit. <laughs> it was like... <laughs> Yeah. Wow, yeah. you fucked that up, right? Yeah. Like I like I get a point nine GPA. I like to get like a three hundred somewhere in my credit score. I like to go so like that's like I said. I want to be badder than everybody else. You, did you it. want bad well, credit? You did it. Fuck you. Watch this. <laughs> you did right. it. Yeah, hold my beer. Is that's my literally my fucking sentiments to everything? Like you want to do this? Uh, hold now. It's hold my coffee. <laughs> but anyway, I uh, where was I? Um. Oh, shit. My train of thought crashed. Um, anyway, I, you know, by this time I had two kids and I, I, I. The apartment had, opened the up apartment across, opened the, across way. the way. The apartment opened across the way. And, um, parents to there we go. Sign. And so I moved into that little apartment and it was one of the first times that I ever lived on my own, oh. not with someone else. Right. You know, when I was 19, I, when I was 17, I moved into the dorms and moved out of them after a semester. Back to my parents' house. From my parents' house, I bought a house at 19, and I moved into it with my then fiance. I'd never had a, an alone apartment yeah. experience. And, and are you full time with the kids? Do I you? had the kids 50 50. We've okay. uh, we Good. I would have them half the time. You know, um, I was working again. Found another job in treatment, um, and 
you know, I've lived this like normal life, like this, you know, go to Target and like have to put things back life. Um, and that was it. You know, it was like seven. No, it was 10 years ago now. Um, but that was where I was at. And I, in all of that, had to go through this process of learning how to find joy and be happy, even if I didn't have the stuff on the outside to prove it. Mm -hmm. You know, and like I would work in treatment. People were like, wait, aren't you on TV? Like, why are you working here? And I was like, I need a job. Like, why wouldn't I? You know, there was, I, I, for me, there was like, there was nothing, I would work, I worked for 10 or $12 an hour when I started in treatment. I was taking out trash and like helping detoxing clients puke. You know what I mean? Like it was not glamorous. Um, but I was willing to start there. And, you know, eventually I worked up and I was working in treatment and I was like, okay, so this is like my life now. And you're staying clean and sober this staying whole time. Staying clean and sober, yeah. And like life was really good. Um, and, you know, I had had one relapse at one point when my younger daughter, um, I had been prescribed um, pills for a car accident. Mm -hmm. And so I learned, I was like, okay, that's, I, somas are not, uh, yeah, it was like a week and I went and I like couldn't pick up a fork and I was like, oh yeah, this is bad. Um, so <laughs> again, like good self check. Go. Yeah, well, so I was good like, be, be able to pick up your cutlery <laughs> at least, feed yourself. Yeah. Right. If you yeah. can't do that, you might have a problem. Yeah. Um, so anyway, but, but I had, you know, I had time at this point. I was working in treatment and everything and, um, Suddenly, I, so I was working at this place and, you know, I get this call that they're wanting to pitch Fuller House. John's, they're wanting to bring it back. They feel like there's an audience that, you know, Candace is into it. Andrea's into it. They want to base it on the three girls. John wants to bring like all. And so the pieces are kind of falling into place as far as like wanting to go out and pitch this. And we all meet about it. I'm like, eh, sure, what the hell? So I'm like living this normal life. And like, I'd have to miss work <laughs> to go to a pitch. And you know, there was like a month there where we were going, we went to ABC Family, we went to ABC, we went to TBS, we went to all these places. Uh, and they were all like, well, I don't know that we want to, you know, bring back something. This was before reboots were like the thing everyone did. And uh, we had this horrible meeting that I actually couldn't make it to. I had a huge meeting um, for for regular work, my my civilian life that day. John couldn't make it. Andrea and Candace like went to the wrong address for Nickelodeon. It was this total shit show of a of a pitch. But at that meeting was um Brian, and I can't think of his name right now. I want to say Grazer, but I think I'm wrong. Uh, who left and then went to Netflix mm -hmm. and brought the idea of Fuller House there and said, Hey, you guys, they're pitching this thing. And we went in to meet with Netflix like a couple like a month and a half later. They were like, Oh, it was the last meeting. And we all went and we were like, it was kind of a Hail Mary, like, okay, sure. You know, I mean, it went well, whatever. And then suddenly we got the call a little while later that like, hey, we're going to pick up the show. And I was like, Wait, I what? Oh, wow. Okay. Oh, like I get to go back to that again so let's talk about a five to 13 you're in entertainment mm -hmm. 13 until how old are you when you get the call that this is going to happen well again? i still stayed in entertainment i okay, did i was still in entertainment like there was i think i shot a um a holiday movie at one point when i was working okay. in treatment like oh, like you know over a month i shot it so like i still kind of had a toe in it okay i did episodes of i did like six episodes of party of five i did you know, guest appearances on Yes Dear and a few other things. So I was still in it throughout okay. my 20s. I did like acting intensives and all that kind of stuff. I was still in it, but I had to, it was at that point I'd had to move on to other things to pay the bills. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, I had child support. I had fucking- Attorney fees. Attorney's yeah. fees. I had rent. I had, you know, um, I had kids. And I also had no ego about- trying something new and starting at the bottom and like, okay, I went you. back to, I went back to school. I got my, you know, a certificate to be a drug and alcohol counselor. That was what I wanted to do. I wanted to go back and become an MFT or a LCSW. Um, so anyway, I, all of a sudden this got dropped in my lap and it was 
it came at a point in my life that I was ready for it. And I knew that I could truly appreciate what I had. And um, yeah, man, walking back on that set. What was that like? It was incredible. At 13 years old, you know, I'll never forget at 13 years old taking that final bow. It gutted me. I sobbed, much like I did on Fuller House, you know. it. But at that time, when I was 13 and I was sobbing, I was sobbing because I was, I knew I was going to miss these people. And I knew that I, that the routine that I had had my entire life, that from when I could remember, basically, I all of a sudden didn't have that anymore. It was gone. And, you know, my parents had always been like, remember, this doesn't last forever. Like, tried to, you know, prepare sure. you for that. But even as an adult, there's right. nothing that really prepares you nothing. for, like, this is a huge loss. And so that really fucked me up, I think, at And 13. also, no one even in your family or most of your friends couldn't even relate to what no, you're nobody, doing or going through. No, nobody, nobody could have had hindsight for that. Nobody, there was no experience for that. No, there was no nothing to to relate to or understand or, you know, and it and and even for myself, I was like, well, I feel silly. Like, if, why am I so upset over this? You know, and as an adult now, I look back and it's like, dude, you were like mourning a huge loss. Like, that's a big deal. Um. So anyway, it, coming back to that set after leaving it at 13 and I mean I could I could go on a visual tour of that same set. Same set, like same set. Almost. There were some th- and it was funny. It was like walking into your childhood home that somebody else has lived in and they've done some remodeling, but like it's kind of the bones are basically the same and like most of the stuff's the same, but like that wasn't there and like oh you guys added a bathroom over here yeah. and like oh that the alcove was bigger or like you know what i mean like the certain things where you were like oh i just i know that house so well that i know it was four steps from here to there and not two you know or whatever mm-hmm. um but for the most part it was the same and i remember walking on set uh, after we did our table reading with the cast and we all walked on there together and that was amazing. Did you that take time to appreciate like the full circle that it just appreciate? I know it's full house, but I know Christ, it's the full so circle I know the full I know, but no, you and, know what? It, it and I what mean, you had, but but the gaps between yes. thirteen and there, everything you had gone everything. through to lead you right back to here now. Like, how about that? It, it With was the modern age of t- tech, digital and everything. Who yeah. would have ever seen it coming back again? And in exactly. a way that it did, you know, it was huge. And that awesome. that was the thing. Like, no, I. <laughs> I mean, God, I've sobbed at the end of um, Fuller, too. And there's actually a beautiful picture that I cherish where I am ho- hugging Andrea and Candace, and it's a picture of my back, and I'm hugging them in the full house living room. And Bob is standing in the background, and he's just looking like this. That's so nice. And it's one you of the – I have it. Yeah. I've posted it. It's one of my favorite photos um, because it says a lot. There's a lot of – there's – 30 some odd years of family history in that photo Mm -hmm. and um, being able to come full circle. And then I did Dancing with the Stars, which, you know, look, it sounds silly. I used to go to ballroom dance competitions in my 20s and watch. I love them. I like I always wanted to do that. Any competition show I've done, I've only done because it was something that I thought that I wanted to learn how to do before. And so if I'm going to get paid to do it and play for charity, sure, fuck it. So I did Dancing with the Stars and then like I started working and I did I had another show that I produced and was like writing on and starring in called Hollywood Darlings, which is a really fun improv based sort of curb your enthusiasm type show with um, Christine Lakin and Beverly Mitchell about being former child stars in Hollywood and continuing to work. And But I started moving more into like adult comedy outside of Full House and and then finding my own voice and finding what that is. And that's kind of where I'm at. In my journey right now is like stretching out a little bit, doing some more fun comedy stuff, writing a little bit here and there, um, leaning into the persona of myself um, and liking who I am outside of just being that girl from Full House. Yeah, fuck yeah. All right, I want to ask you. Have- I feel like I've rambled on. I give the world's longest fucking answers. I feel like you this here, and um, this is just me. I'm I'm, I'm gonna just call it out in like my head because my head is like, 
Shut up, woman. You no. have bored them all. So I hope you I didn't it. bore you. Okay. Please. This is your episode. Okay. You told me to be quiet and wait till you hear this shit. And I sat here and listened. Yeah, I mean. But I have questions. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, so let's get to the questions. Who tells you about your biological father's murder in prison? Is that your adoptive parents? That like, was my adopted parents. Yeah. When Because I, you know, I, I mean, the, the glaring question, where was I from? Where, what, who, you know, what happened? Um, and I was... Mature, and I understood quite a, quite a bit. You know mm-hmm. what I mean. I was not like a typical when eleven you found year old. Out. I yeah, I okay. was able to kind of understand things and process things. I mean, you know, again, well as well as an eleven year old can. But my parents were very honest with me, which I don't regret, and I respect very much because I I they, they on top of the bullshit that I was processing. The fact that they had lied to me was never something that was in there, mm-hmm. and I'm grateful for that. Some parents, I think, try and, like, blow it off or not tell them the truth or whatever because they don't want to hurt them or are afraid that they can't handle it at a young age. And I think there's a way to do it that allows you to be honest because if that would have been the case, like, that would have been yet one more, you know— thing um what about your biological mom did you ever connect with her i never did and i learned recently that she passed in 2013 um do you know how i don't know how uh you know and and it's weird um how'd you find out uh, i found out through what was through i think it was maybe ancestry or so i did a little digging because i did like the 23 and me because i was uh-huh. like what the fuck am i right. uh i am the, uh potentially the whitest person on the planet <laughs> um no actually i'm not i re- they re-updated it i've got seven percent italian wait they re-updated it they oh, updated it and apparently i have seven percent italian update it all of a sudden fuck, I don't no, do do I don't that? do DNA. I send my shit in so that I can be recorded and potentially tracked for the rest of my life. And they send it back to you like, hey, we, we actually. Well, I'm like English, Irish, Scott. I mean, look at me. I'm just a like a Nordic fucking English, Welsh, wet dream. It's just blonde, blue eyed, you know. But apparently I have 7% Italian. That okay. was it. But for a while there, it was, it was like 99.9% just, just boring ass white people. Uh, but anyway, I. Um, I didn't. I, I found out about her through through I think Ancestry Me or Twenty Three and Me, but from what I heard, um, she you know she struggled her whole life, and I knew you know she had other kids that That's went what I to, to ask yeah you. she had other kids. Um, uh, one of whom I recently connected with who lives on the East Coast, and I actually need to call her back. Um, so you have some siblings that you there's re- some out just there found out about. Uh, no, or? I knew that that some of them okay. were out there. Um, but, uh, you know, now through the wonders of d- DNA testing, you find them. Um, so I, I've emailed and talked to one girl that's my half sister, um, who I think looks like me, um, or I look like her cause I think she's a little older. Uh, but yeah, I, you know, she lived a hard life. My, uh, the story that I have and what I know and the small bits of paperwork and things that I have. Um, and the, the story that my parents were told by the social worker was just that she, you know, she had been on her own really since she was 15, been on the streets, um, kind of did what she had to do to survive and, um, you know, got caught up in like drugs and bad checks and trying to just k- keep things together, changed her name a lot, you know, was do trying to survive. Do you know if she raised any of her children? I don't know if she did. I don't believe she did. Uh, a, there was a woman who contacted me who was a foster parent, um, and I think she had another one or two of her kids. Oh. I think one, maybe. Um, so I think there's like at least three or four. So um, I don't know. But I, you know, and it's funny because, uh, I, you know, I went from – being angry at her to being very proud of her, of my biological mom and saying, you know what, you knew your limitations. Like you, you, you know what, you, you, you were doing what you had to do to survive and you were with somebody and you got pregnant and you, you know, decided to have it, but you knew you couldn't do it. And so you would give up your kid. And like, in some ways that's the ultimate selflessness right is to go i can't do this for you someone else has to 
And um, and it, once I got to that place in my life, and I got there after having my own kid, I was going to ask you if being a mom shifted. Being a mom shifted everything. Yeah. Like it really shifted everything because suddenly, you know, and it shifted my relationship with um, my mom because now, and I think that happens anyway once you get older. Like all of a sudden, you're like, oh shit! Like you were just a person trying to figure this out too. No wonder some sometimes it got a little fucked up. Like you were just a human being trying to have your own experience. And you start seeing your parents and your family as like whole people. Yeah. And you're like, I only saw, because I know my kids only see the mom side of me. Right. And I remember my mom said that to me one time. She said, you only see the mom side of me. She was like, trust me, when I'm out with my girlfriends, that's my that's the other side. And I was like, oh shit, that's true. I will always have a mother daughter dynamic with you. You're always going to be able to look at me and I can, like, you dude, know. I remember the first time I saw a teacher out in public and I was like, right, you're like, oh my God, you're, you're a huge person. You live outside of the classroom. Right. Yeah. Like, it, you yeah. know, and as you get older, <laughs> like, and, and I think also as you get older and your parents start telling their fucked up stories of like, oh, this one time I was at a, you know, Bob Dylan concert and we smoked weed in this van and, you know, and you're like, oh my God, like, you were human too. Yeah. And I've just come to this greater appreciation um, of my mom and my parents, but particularly my mom um, and everything that she did for me, you know, and like she, her entire life was my life. And um, I had a great relationship with her because of that. Um, but like I, my birth mom gave me a life beyond my wildest expectations by being able to walk away, you know? And that yeah. takes that takes a lot. That takes a lot. So That's really well said. This has been a, a really great episode. I appreciate you, you coming on. Now I'm going to ask you what I told you I was going to ask you at the beginning, advice mm -hmm. you give to your 16-year-old self, because it's a very interesting time for you. You're just a couple years off of Full House. Yep. You're in high school. What advice do you think you would tell yourself at 16? Ooh. Hmm. You're worth more. Good for you. That's great. Yeah, you're worth more. Uh, yeah, I think 16-year-old me needed to hear that. No, well, thank you again for being our guest on the 200th episode. I am so honored uh, to have come and babbled at you for an extensive I period of time. I loved it. Are you serious? <laughs> I loved it. And, and, you know, the best part, look, I laugh at myself. Like, on paper, I am a fucking disaster. I am a, a thrice divorced, <laughs> thrice. Four, a four-time married to— Oh, you did get married again. I, did, I thought I saw I did, that. I did. Is it pretty recently, too? It, in July, July 30th. Right, and I, he is he is my person. I fucking love him. I finally, like, finally, finally right. figured out— I finally figured out what I wanted in a relationship and that I get to actually show up to it, too, and, like, have a good person yeah. and that I'm worth it. I finally figured that out. Um, but— yeah, I, you know, I, I just recently got married and, uh, you know, on paper, I like, it's not cute. Like, if you write things down, I'm like, okay, look, look, look. The resume is not <laughs> the full picture. Bring me in. Put my stats Bring me in for an interview. <laughs> I swear to Let God. Let me charm you a Let, little bit. I am a charming motherfucker. <laughs> Let me tell you. But if you just read it on paper, you're like, okay, wow, treatment yeah. twice, sober at eight. Sorry, drinking at 13. Okay, you got ma married on a dare. Three times, Jesus, oh, two big. Okay, one kid with another person. Great, God. like you go through the thing and you're like, wow. Uh, but but also uh, you but live through all. I of live that. through all of that, and I have some fucking hilarious stories. Yeah, like I, I've got stories for days. I am gonna be the old crazy lady. Uh, at the dinner table telling the most inappropriate stories because I'm 85 and fuck you, I can. Yeah, that's right. So, and you yeah. got a ton of them. Oh, 
Yeah. So well, many. next time you can come back and share stories. I would love to. Yeah, we'll I do that. I would love to. Um, wait, one more time, please plug and promote everything you'd like. Um, you can follow me across all socials at Jody Sweeten. Um, I am most active on Instagram because I'm old. Um, <laughs> and TikTok confuses me. Uh, no, but I'm most active on there. You can check out my podcast, Never Thought I'd Say This, at Never Thought I'd Say This on social media. Um, and I will. I post everything that I'm up to on there. I've been doing a couple episodes of Picture Night, which is actually really fun hosting that, or um, uh, being one of the team captains on that. I've been just trying to stay busy and doing some fun creative stuff. So check it out at Jody Sweeten, and I keep everything updated on there. All right. Thank you again. I'm I really so appreciate glad, it, Jody. I'm Hell so yeah. glad to be here, and uh, I can't back. believe that I revealed all of that to um, these these wonderful people. You did a great job. They're going to love it. <laughs> Thanks. Um, as always, RyanSickler.com, Ryan Sickler on all social media. We'll talk to you all next week. Mm-hmm.